At what point in our lives do we recognise our need for balance? And what about this concept of being made whole? Is it just a myth that we aimlessly pursue or is it something that can be part of our reality? And then in Christianity, there's this term to be holy. Have I mucked up too much? Is this even possible anymore? Join me now as we explore what it means to truly be made whole. of us, balance doesn't become significant until we find ourselves out of balance. It could be because of a health issue, a tragedy that you face, a broken relationship, it could be an accident or it could even be getting to the point when you realise that you don't have control of your life anymore. In 2014 I moved to Australia to do postgraduate studies. While I was there, I was working full time as well as studying. I had jobs such as working in a library and cleaning. It was during these moments when I was sitting there studying that I started to recognize some strange symptoms happening with my body. There was tingling in my face and a warm sensation moving down one side of my body. Later that evening, I was at an event and I was called up the front. And as I was walking up the front, I started to think, I'm gonna fall over, I'm gonna fall over. What happens if I fall over? I walked up the front, still on my two feet. And as I walked back, I thought the same thing. I'm gonna fall over. What happens if I fall over? Why do I want to fall over all the time? During the next couple of weeks, I was still playing basketball. One night we were playing in a competitive game. We were playing in the semis and there were only four who could make it from my team. So I had to be on the basketball court. I was standing there with tears in my eyes and I said to my team, I can't run. I'm sorry, I don't know why, I just can't run. They said, that's okay, you just stay down this end of the court. It went against everything in me not to be able to participate properly with my team. But I stood and did what I could. In the end, I finally had to bite the bullet and go and see a doctor. As an international student in Australia, it wasn't cheap. So I decided I'm just going to do it because something is wrong. I went to the doctor and there they concluded, there's nothing wrong with you. You're just stressed and you're sitting in the same position for too long. Meanwhile, the headaches got worse. The pain got worse. I started to get really clumsy. This happened on and off. I got special permission in my exams to sit at the back in case I fell out of my chair, but I just made do. I just kept saying to myself, stop stressing and you won't feel these symptoms anymore. Stop sitting in the same position and they'll go away. This happened for the two years that I did my postgraduate studies. Then I moved back to South New Zealand to work as a pastor. During my first year back, it was super busy. I was doing so much and my symptoms just got worse and worse and worse. I couldn't walk at night anymore without falling over. As soon as there was no light, I would feel myself moving or swaying from one side to the other. I would go out and I'd be running and I couldn't tell how far the ground was from the bottom of my foot. So I was stomping along the footpath. I couldn't even walk through a mall when there was light without holding someone's arm because even though I thought I was walking in a straight line, I started to veer off to the side. But I kept telling myself, stop stressing, you're just doing this to yourself. You're dishonoring God because you're causing yourself to become sick. Then I got a brand new, really strange symptom. So I went to my GP and my GP is awesome. The first thing she said is, it's a process of elimination. I'm gonna send you to a neurologist. So I got a referral and I went to a neurologist and she at first did all the same tests that I'd had done by that GP back in Australia. And then she noticed something really strange. Every time I closed, closed my eyes, I fell backwards. I just couldn't have my eyes closed and be able to stand steady on my feet. So she sent me for an MRI. I can remember lying in the MRI machine thinking, why am I in this machine? 
someone who really needs this should be here. I'm wasting the taxpayer's money. Why am I here? I'm taking someone else's place. The next day, I didn't really think it was strange that I'd already received a letter in the mail to return to my neurologist. I simply thought it must be clear they're gonna get me off the books and I've just gotta take better care of myself. So the next day I went walking into the neurologist's office, not expecting anything. The first thing she said to me was, the good news is your brain is beautiful. Then she said, but we can see some stuff happening in your spine. She concluded that it was most likely multiple sclerosis or MS. I had to take a number of tests that weren't fun. I ended up in hospital and everything for it to be confirmed but I can remember the morning she walked into my hospital room and she said, you do have multiple sclerosis. It was almost like I was relieved to finally have a name for what was happening. I wasn't doing it to myself. It was something that was happening to me. But at the same time, I started to freak out because if you're anything like me, as soon as you're given the possibility of a diagnosis, you start searching on the internet and you see all the horror stories of what happens to everybody else. So in my mind, I was already going to plan B for my ministry. In my mind, I was already deciding if I was gonna be able to work as a pastor anymore. Am I gonna be able to work with young people anymore? Who am I gonna be able to rely on to help me walk? What happens when I can't drive anymore? Do I have any control of my life? I suddenly felt extremely helpless. I felt isolated even because I was single living by myself and I felt like I was gonna be pushed in to be dependent on someone else. I then began the long emotional and psychological journey and after that came the physical journey. I'd been given medication and I was dealing with all these side effects. I couldn't figure out what was worse the side effects of the medication or actually coping with the MS. It took me six months before I began to look at other avenues to work towards feeling better. I connected with a young person, I used to be his youth leader and he was now working as a personal trainer. I began working with him and then I began working with a nutritionist as well. It wasn't what was prescribed to me by a medical practitioner but I was desperate. I was willing to do anything to feel better, to feel more in control, to feel like I could feel whole again. I was so desperate for healing. I felt like I was a bit stupid at times, working out at the gym, everyone around me pumping weights or doing amazing things. And there I was learning to stand on one leg again for 30 seconds. It was brain draining. I had to concentrate so hard. I was sweating just trying to do that. And on top of it, I was dealing with anxiety. So many times I'd walk into the gym changing room, cry as I changed. I'd walk out into the gym and I'd stand there sweating, standing on one leg. But I kept saying to myself, stronger than yesterday, stronger than yesterday. It's not about anyone else. Just trust the process. Then I had to cope with how everyone who cared about me was coping. It was hard for them to sit there and watch me go through this. Some people would even say, haven't you been through enough in life? I had to deal with friends trying to be there for me even when they were hurting for me. It's one thing for, for you to be able to hurt for someone else and want to alleviate their pain. It's another thing to be the person who is experiencing the pain and having to watch those who love you, watch you through it and have pain in their own eyes. I felt like I was responsible for how they were feeling. It was a long journey. It wasn't a pain-free journey, but it was definitely a blessed journey. Stronger than yesterday, I kept telling myself, stronger than yesterday, you and God, you've got this, you've got this. Don't worry about anyone else. I'm so thankful for this experience. I'm so thankful and I'm so blessed and I can say God is so good. Not because I've received instant healing, but because I've received an amazing relationship and I've been blessed every single step of the way. 
And I know I'm not the only one who's yearning for healing and doesn't experience it instantly. But I can't help but wonder, what would that be like? What would it be like to experience instant healing? Not only that, to feel truly whole. I want to invite you now to journey with me as we look at one of these stories from the Bible when 10 people experienced instant healing. In Luke chapter 17, verses 11 to 19, it tells us this story. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no, no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go, your faith has made you well. Now when I first read this passage, so many questions come to mind before I can even understand what it's trying to tell me. Why did they stand at a distance and yell at Jesus? Why didn't Jesus invite them closer like he did on so many other occasions? He just sent them on their way. Why did only one turn back? Why did only one feel the need to come and thank the one who had declared that they would be clean? Why did Jesus say at the end to that one leper, your faith has made you well? Weren't the other nine made well as well? Well, let's take a closer look to gain a better perspective. Now, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He's between where he's come from and where he's going. It's not uncommon for us to see that Jesus does ministry on his way to places. And he's always so intentional with each and every encounter. Now, when the lepers stand at a distance and yell at him, to some it may appear rude, but this was actually protocol. People who had this type of sickness were considered unclean, so they had to isolate themselves from people. So they were following the culture of the day. It's amazing even when we consider that they called him master. They recognized that there was something about him. The fact that they were there and they were mixing with each other meant that they had found a sense of community, but they were still isolated. As we continue in the story and we look at other questions that come to mind, it may seem strange. Things like, why didn't Jesus invite them closer? Why did he send them off at a distance? Why did he send them off to the priests? Well, this was also common practice. You had to be declared clean by the priests. He was the high priest, but they went through the culture of the day. I wonder what it was like for them as they turned and they started going towards the priests. What was their conversation? Were they still calling out, unclean, unclean, as they went? Or were they walking and claiming that they were already made clean? What was it that made this one leper turn back and thank the person who had healed him? And what does he do when he turns back? He comes close to Jesus, he falls at his feet and he praises him. How come just one leper chose to come back and meet the person face to face, up close and personal, the one who had saved him, the one who had healed him instantly? And at the end of verse 16, we notice a strange statement, and he was a Samaritan. Can you imagine how we might read that? and he was a Samaritan. Shock, is it disgust? Is it disbelief? He was a Samaritan. What's so strange about this statement? It's because Samaritans did not mix with the Jewish people. Samaritans themselves were outcasts. So to be a Samaritan and a leper meant that you were experiencing deep isolation. You were in pain on so many levels. 
But here we have Jesus. Here we have Jesus having a divine impact in his life. Here we have Jesus accepting him at his feet and making a point that even a Samaritan, even someone who is a total outcast, I still love them. I still desire to heal them. I still welcome them into my presence. What is that saying to us today? Those of us who may say, I've done too much to even come before God. I don't deserve to be healed. This tells us that God invites us into his presence. This tells us that God desires that we would be made whole. What was it about one that thought that they must turn back? What compelled him to come to his savior? It was a heart of gratitude, a heart of thanks. He had received what he longed to receive. And then Jesus questions, where are the other nine? And then he makes that statement, your faith has made you well. What did he mean when he said this? Wasn't he already clean? Wasn't he already well? I believe God just said right there in that moment, you are completely whole because you turned and you recognized me, because you received healing from me and you chose to approach me as your healer because you know that I saved you from a life of isolation and you chose to come and worship me as your savior. You are made completely well in every sense of the word. And this is the healing that we too are promised in Jesus. He desires to make us whole, to make us well, not that we would only experience physical healing, but we would experience spiritual healing as well. A lot of us know that the scars we experience in life, they are great at being a reminder for us of what we've been through, but it's the emotional scars, the spiritual scars, the psychological scars that we carry that really do have the bigger impact. Those are the ones that draw us back to our past identity. But God desires that we know a new, a fresh identity in Him. This is where he makes us not only whole, but holy. Isn't it amazing to consider that in the process of being made whole, that we are declared holy. In the process of getting our lives on track, in the process of experiencing healing, we can already claim this identity as being a holy people. We are told in scripture that Jesus is both the one who is holy and makes us holy. Let's read this together. Hebrews 2 verse 11 says, both the one who makes people holy and those who are holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. How amazing is that? Jesus isn't ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters. Think about that for a moment. Us, broken us. When I think of myself, most days I still feel physically broken, but it doesn't change the fact that Jesus is making me whole daily. And it doesn't change the fact that I am holy because the one who is holy has made me holy. What grace, what a beautiful gift we receive when we choose to go to Jesus and receive healing from him. He gives us so much more than we expect. My body could be broken for the rest of my life and I can handle that because I'm whole in Jesus. I can handle that because I have a new identity that says I'm not broken. It says I am holy. If I was to receive instant healing like that, but to not know Jesus, it wouldn't be enough. I would still be longing for something more. I would still be longing to know Jesus the true healer, more than to receive healing for myself. This is why I believe our greatest need is Jesus. I can't stand the concept that God is our vending machine, that every time we need something, we shoot up a prayer and hopefully that he will answer us just the way we want him to. That sometimes we wouldn't even speak to him unless we need something and expect something from him God is our vending machine, but this isn't our God that we see here in the pages of the Bible. A God that just wants us to throw up a need, throw up a request every now and again. Heal me today, Lord, and carry on with my life. 
He doesn't want that. He invites me into relationship with him. He's asking me to trust him. He's actually inviting me to trust him and let him take control and to bless me beyond what I could ever ask. God desires that I would simply come to him with the intention of letting him do what he desires to do in my life, to let him do beyond the physical healing or the physical need that I want met. This is our God, this is our greatest need, Jesus. And our greatest gift is Jesus. It's not a God who's off in the distance, it's a God who invites us into relationship. Jesus came into this world and saved us. He came and gave his life because he loves us. Jesus is our gift. Jesus is our friend. He's not something that we receive and put on the shelf and never ever interact with. He's not something that we treat like everything else and just use it when we need him. Jesus wants to be in daily relationship with us. It is a gift to consider that I can walk with my God, that he will hold my hand during those moments when I experience anxiety, that he will carry me when my legs are too tired, that he will restore me every single time I consider my, myself broken, that he will be a reminder again and again, I'm still with you. I still love you. I'm still here for you. This is our greatest gift. And our greatest witness, this is Jesus also, that we can witness of a God who is alive and active in our lives. How amazing is it to consider that he would use us in our brokenness to witness as a God of love, that he would choose us to witness as his hands and his feet. I never ever would have thought it possible that the multiple sclerosis that I experience every single day would be something that can contribute to my ministry, not something that restricts me in ministry, not something that I have to consider what I need to give up in life, but something that gives me more opportunity more reason to grow, more of a connector with people. Jesus is my greatest witness because of how he continues to work in my life, for how he has made me whole, for how I can claim an identity as being holy. He is my greatest witness. This is why I can sit here today and share without a doubt that we serve a loving God who desires for us to experience healing, not just for now, but for eternity. Can you imagine that? To live a life forever where we experience complete love, complete peace, free from hurt and pain. My greatest witness is Jesus, not anything that I've accomplished, but everything he's done in me. Not because I have a perfect body, but because I serve a perfect God who loves me unconditionally. What about you? Where do you desire to experience healing in your own life? It may even be other people that you care about that come to mind when I ask that question. Where in your life do you want to be made whole? What would it mean if you could take on this identity as being holy? What would that really mean for you? Not holier than now, when we think we're perfect, but when we claim this identity as a child of God. Our greatest need, our greatest gift, and our greatest witness is all found in Jesus. And we are all extended this beautiful gift to come and to know Him, to call out from wherever you are. Or maybe it's that you will come close and fall at His feet, Maybe you can't even find the words and you simply let your tears do the talking for you. Jesus is listening, no matter how loud or quiet you may be. Jesus is listening and ready and desires to make you whole. So what would that look like in your life? What is the next step for you? What could God potentially be inviting you to do right now? All of us have a different story and God isn't any bigger or any greater because I've been through some tough times in my life. You may be sitting there and say, I haven't really been through everything. My finances are okay. I have good relationships. 
there's just something missing. God still invites you to call out His name. He is still big and you need Him just as much as I need Him. We all need Jesus every single day. I know from my own experience that it wouldn't be possible for me to be able to do what I do without Him. I have so much peace and reassurance. I can look back over my journey and say that in the last five years, when I've been on this path, I've known a closer walk with God. I've known greater joy in my life. Yes, I may experience physical restrictions at time, but I see it as an opportunity to simply draw close. And I'm always blessed and I always receive more than I could ever ask. God has to remind me, you are still whole. You are still holy. I forget, I'm human. Sometimes I turn my back and sometimes I turn towards him, but the fact remains he is always there. He is always ready and he is always waiting for me to simply call on his name. The story of these 10 lepers, it is a blessing when we read and we see that Jesus is prepared to heal. He is prepared to make us clean. But the greatest moment in the story, the moment of true connection, is when someone comes back, a Samaritan, and falls at his feet and simply worships him. My prayer for you today is that you would know this type of intimacy with Jesus, that you'll willingly come and fall at his feet and be thankful that you're found not only healed, but in the presence of a healer. Let me pray with you now. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity we have to be made whole by you. May it become our reality, I pray in your mighty name. Amen. Mm -hmm.